So the work that I'm going to talk about briefly today is a collaboration between Michael Eschbaumer and colleagues at the Friedrich Loeffler Institute in Germany and myself and others who are members of the World Reference Laboratory for Foot and Mouth Disease here at the Perbright Institute in the UK. And we were looking at inactivation of foot and mouth disease virus with commercially available lysis buffers. There is a general assumption that lysis buffers provided in nucleic acid extraction kits are effective at inactivating viruses, but this isn't always the case and a few things that need to be considered. With your virus, is it an envelope virus or non-envelope virus? And what is the anticipated titer of the virus in your samples? What is the sample type? Is it a clarified sample such as an isolate or is it a more complex matrix such as whole blood or whole milk? What is the composition of the lysis buffer? So looking at the percentage of the denaturing agent, has a detergent been added and what is the pH of the buffer? And additionally, what temperature does the reaction take place? Is it at room temperature or heated? So shown here are a number of different studies that have evaluated, evaluated lysis buffers with virus inactivation, the majority of which are coming from studies with Ebola virus soon after the outbreak in West Africa. The results from these studies varied from complete to incomplete inactivation for the lysis buffers tested. However, where residual infectivity was observed, this was eliminated by heating. These studies have highlighted the importance of lysis buffer validation, particularly in terms of biosafety surrounding high consequence pathogens. There are only a limited number of facilities worldwide that can safely handle such pathogens, and within these facilities, there is a limitation on the lab space and the testing capacity. But if able to demonstrate reliable inactivation of high consequence pathogens, samples could be safely handled at lower levels of containment. This would be particularly beneficial during outbreaks when sample submissions are high and turnaround time, times for results are crucial. Evaluating the effectiveness of lysis buffers with foot and mouth disease virus was first brought to our attention in 2015 at an EU national ref lab meeting when Dr. Bern Haas from FLI presented data indicating that commercial lysis buffers alone were not effective at inactivating FMDV. This then led our group at the World Reference Laboratory for FMD to evaluate the lysis buffers that were currently in use for diagnostic testing. This then later developed into a collaboration with FLI. Before we selected the lysis buffers to use in our study, we decided to take a survey of the 27 EU FMDV diagnostic labs to find out what was currently in use. And what we found was that in February 2018, there were a total of 16 different lysis buffers being used, all of which contain guanidinium compound as an active ingredient, and the most commonly used lysis buffer was AVL. We decided to include three lysis buffers in our experiments. The first was AL buffer, which was in use at FLI. The second was AVO, and we selected this because it was used by over a quarter of the EU FMDV diagnostic labs. And the third one that we selected was MagMax Core, which at the time wasn't currently being used by any laboratories, but was the replacement to the MagMax kit, which was being used at the Perbright Institute. As you will have noticed on the previous slide, the active ingredient in AL buffer is guanidinium hydrochloride, whereas for AVL and MagMax core is guanidinium thiocyanate. Additionally, the percentage of these active ingredients varies greatly, ranging anywhere from 20 to 100%, and the ratio and volumes of the lysis buffer to sample also vary greatly, as indicated here by the manufacturer recommendations. To evaluate the effectiveness of the three lysis buffers, we developed a standardized method and used this method both at FLI and TPI when conducting experiments. So shown here in green, again, are the three lysis buffers that we selected. And then for each of our experiments, we used the same virus, which was a serotype A virus from Iran, which had a titer of 7.4 log 10 TCID 50 per mil. This isolate was selected as it is diagnostically relevant and belongs to the A Asia G7 lineage that emerged from the Indian subcontinent in 2015 and caused multiple outbreaks. After adding the virus to the lysis buffer at the ratio recommended by the manufacturer, the tubes were mixed and left to incubate for 10 minutes at room temperature. The mixture was then diluted to eliminate the cytotoxic effect of the lysis buffers on cells. These experiments were conducted separately with just the lysis buffer alone. 
This way, if virus was present, it would be able to replicate and the cells wouldn't be stripped. We then took the diluted solution and inoculated LFBK alpha B beta 6 cells, which are a pig cell line that has been transduced to express the integrin receptor, alpha V beta 6, which is a known receptor for FMDV. We examined the cells daily for three days for cytopathic effect or CPE, and we had three technical replicates per lysis buffer and then three tubes or wells per replicate. If CPE was observed as shown here by the cell rounding, we then tested the sample by FMDV antigen ELISA to confirm for the presence of virus. If no CPE was present by day three, we did a blind passage where we froze the sample and passed it onto new cells and observed for three days. We conducted these experiments with three sample types or matrices. The first was a virus isolate, which is a clarified sample. The second was spiked epithelium suspension, which is the ideal sample type for FMDV diagnostics. So this is where tissue is collected from an unruptured or recently ruptured vesicle and then homogenized. And the third sample type selected was spiked milk. And milk, although is an easy sample type to collect, it is highly complex because of the high protein, sugar and fat content. On the next three slides, I'll show the results from our study. Briefly, these results are grouped by lysis buffer. So on this slide, it's the AL buffer results. And then within the results in the table, we have our isolate, our spiked epithelium suspension, and our spiked milk, and then PASS1 and PASS2 for each of these sample types. And again, we were looking for cytopathic effect or CPE on the cells. In each of these experiments, we also had three controls, the first being the cell control or negative control. Um, and then we had a virus control and a lysis buffer cytotoxicity control. As I mentioned, we did experiments to determine dilutions at which the cytotoxicity of the lysis buffer was eliminated, and then the virus control, lysis buffer control, and the treatment, our virus plus lysis buffer, were all diluted to that same dilution. The results for our controls were as expected in that the cell control and the lysis buffer cytotoxicity controls were both negative on passes one and two for all three sample types, and the virus control for all three sample types was positive, as confirmed by FMDV antigen ELISA. Most importantly, if you look at this bottom row, so this is with our sample plus our lysis buffer, we found that all three matrices were negative for CPE with buffer AL. We found the results to be identical for AVL buffer is shown here. And we also found the same results for the MagMax core buffer shown here. Overall, these data demonstrate that three lysis buffers tested were effective at reducing FMDV infectivity to undetectable levels for all three matrices tested, which based on calculations is a 3.1 to less than 5.1 log 10 reduction in virus. We found that the dilutions used did not compromise the sensitivity of the test as indicated by CPE being observed with a virus control, and that complex methods to remove the lysis buffer, such as dialysis, neutralization, or size exclusion columns was not necessary. And although we did only test one serotype A virus, preliminary studies conducted at TPI suggested that there were no differences by serotype. We believe that the methods and results presented here will be useful for other labs that study FMDV, but need to stress that additional validation experiments may be required. For example, we know that there are a number of different lysis buffers or extraction kits that are currently in use, and that even though these lysis buffers may contain the same active ingredients as we've tested, that they might not work the same given the wide range of percentages of the active ingredients and the different lysis buffer to sample ratios defined by the manufacturers. You also need to consider the sample matrices received and tested in the lab, so making sure that each of these uh, viruses in each of these sample types can be inactivated. And then you can also consider adding a secondary inactivation step, such as heat, the addition of ethanol, or detergent. And this could be if you found the lysis buffer not able to completely inactivate the virus, or it could be just as a secondary precaution step before removing samples to a low level of containment. One question that's often raised with this work is whether the sample can be shipped 
in lysis buffer directly to lower level containment labs for molecular testing? The simple answer is yes, it is possible, but there are a lot of factors that need to be considered. So first, by inactivating the sample, you are eliminating the biological hazard, but you are adding a chemical hazard. The lysis buffers are hazardous, and so the samples will need to be shipped as a hazardous chemical. Shipping both biological and chemical hazardous samples are costly. The exact cost varies depending on where the samples are being shipped, the weight of the package, the volume of the samples within the package, whether dry ice is required, etc. Obviously, the benefit with these inactivated samples is that they can immediately go into labs at lower levels of containment. But with a sample type, you are limited to molecular testing, such as PCR and sequencing, whereas when you ship live virus, you have more unlimited testing opportunities. That said, if you are able to recover full genome of a positive sense RNA virus, such as FMDV, you might be able to recover live virus by transfecting susceptible cells. There are also a number of other things that need to be considered. You need to ensure procedures have been adequately followed at source. So this is either samples coming from a high containment lab or if you're sending samples directly from the field. You need to know that the lysis buffer has been prepared and stored correctly. Quite often the lysis buffers require two or more reagents to be added together before use. You also need to know what the shelf life is of that lysis buffer. Does it need to be prepared fresh daily or can it be stored for weeks or months? You need to know that the correct volume of sample has been added to the correct volume of lysis buffer. And you need to know the level of accuracy required. For example, do you need calibrated pipettes? You also need to ensure that the packaging and the outer surfaces are fully disinfected because these samples are being shipped to lower level labs that cannot handle live virus. You also need to make sure that the lysis buffer used at source, so used with adding to your sample, matches the extraction method used at the molecular lab. This can either be done by ordering the lysis buffer separately, so this is possible with AL buffer through chiogen, or the molecular lab would need to send lysis buffer to the source lab and then have it shipped back. But again, this would be costly because of the chemical hazard. You also need to consider storage and shipment conditions. So this is conditions after the sample has been added to lysis buffer and before during shipment. This includes both a wide range of temperatures, so room temperature, minus 80 or on dry ice, but also different lengths in time. So how long are the samples sitting in the lab or being shipped for? You need to also get the correct vial type. So something that is leak proof and break proof that can withstand shipment as well as the different temperatures. And you also need to consider the overall goal of this is recovering nucleic acid. So how long can the samples sit in lysis buffer or at these different temperatures without affecting the recovery of nucleic acid? So to answer the question again, yes, it is possible to ship in lysis buffers, but there are many other factors that need to be considered or evaluated before shipment can occur. So with that, we would just like to end by saying that this work is dedicated to the memory of Bernd Haas. Without his initial studies, none of this probably would have happened. We would also like to thank Holger at FLI who conducted the experiments on their end. At the Perbright Institute, we would like to thank the VDRL group for their endless support and feedback throughout the development of this project. At Plum Island, we would like to thank Luis and Miguel for providing both labs with the LFBK Alpha V Beta 6 cells. At Thermo Fisher, we would like to thank Damien for providing the Magmax core lysis buffer, as well as Julie, Andrea, and Jorn for technical support. And lastly, our colleagues in the EU reference laboratories who participated in our lysis buffer survey. And also thank you for your attention.